Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are about to start. Uh, this is a session organized by some national and uh, regional uh, internet governance forum, NRIs, as you might know. Uh, and this slot uh, is going to be dedicated to discuss uh, a specific issue related to um, digital economy. So first and foremost, let me just uh, recall the title of the session. The session, uh, the title that was built together by a group of national and regional IGFs, uh, which worked together in the, in the configuration of this proposal. Uh, we are going to talk about developing regional, national, and local digital economy ecosystems, assessing the roles, perspectives, and responsibilities of uh, different stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder uh, fashion. Uh, to begin with, uh, I, I would just like to say that I he have here colleagues from the Arab IGF, the French IGF, the Brazilian IGF, and the Panamanian IGF. I myself, I'm Diego. I work for the Brazilian Internet Governance Steering Committee, um, who is the multi-stakeholder uh, entity in charge of developing uh, policies uh, and um, guidelines for the use uh, and governance of, of inter the internet in Brazil. Uh, and I was chosen uh, to be the moderator of this session uh, five minutes ago. Uh, I'm, I'm here with uh, colleagues also from the Brazilian uh, IGF, but um, from the Panamanian IGF, uh, the two uh, ladies by my side. Uh, one of them is going to be a panelist and the other one is helping us uh, with um, the um, online moderation. And we actually uh, regret that the others IGF, which also joined efforts to produce um, uh, this panel, did not actually uh, show up to <laughs> be here with us. Uh, we have the Panamanian IGF, Later on, we will present the speakers. Uh, we have the French IGF and the Arab IGF. And it's a pity that uh, we have a, a practically a, a, a two-thirds male panel, which is a bummer for the 2018 IGF. Uh, it's the 21st century, right? Uh, we will uh, divide this session in three different uh, uh, segments. The first segment, uh, each of the panelists will just present themselves and say, uh, where they come from, so their the, the institutions and the national IGF in which they work for. The second one is going to be structured around three main policy questions uh, in which each participant will um, uh, provide some preliminary answers and po provide some policy perspectives from the region that they come from. So uh, the MENA region, the Europe, uh, the European region, the uh, Latin American region. Uh, and then in the third segment, we are going to open the microphone for questions and answers from the audience, maybe to try to broaden our perspectives and to bring perspectives from other regions which are not these three regions in the table. So let me just start with my extreme left. Could you just present yourself? Thank you, and thank you everyone for being, staying here late. Okay. I'm Charles Shaban. I'm uh, the chair of the Arab Mag uh, this year. Um, so mainly I'm representing the Arab IGF. Um, I'm like our moderator. I was called on in the last minute to be honest to cover this, uh, this, this session and specifically because I was participating in other sessions. But um, uh, sorry to say one of my colleagues who is mainly Mirna Barbar, who uh, she works with the United Nations ESQA, who uh, oversee the Arab IGF couldn't come in the last minute, so uh, this is it. So I'll try to do my best to cover for her because this is mainly her work. She worked hard on it um, more than the uh, the group of the MAG. I mean, in this about digital mainly, uh, what we are talking about mainly. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Armin Kachetorov. I'm from France and. Um, from academia sector, so I work at, uh, I'm a researcher actually at uh, uh, Institut Min Telecom Business School, and um, which is b a business school in a larger context of a network of engineering schools in France. And uh, I work on personal data protection and uh, personal data policies. And I will be participating here this evening. And uh, so my, 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 my 
uh, my uh, few words, my uh, contribution will be a little bit maybe different because I will take a s little bit larger perspective from the social sciences perspective. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Divaldo Cleto. I'm a businessman in Brazil and a member of the board of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGI.br, representing Internet Corporate users in the country. Well, good afternoon. My name is Crisia Matthews. I'm a board member from a civil society organization called Ivanditech, which is part of the IGEF Panama. Ifandetech is a digital rights organization based in Panama City, and it's working in advocacy and research about public policy, internet in Central America. Thank you all. Um, so uh, to begin our discussions, um, the objective of this panel is try to put the human component in discussions related to uh, the development of digital ecosystems in the countries we, we represent. Uh, and um, as you know, uh, the digital economy is one of the linchpins of, of the sustainable development goals. And uh, based on that, uh, on that assumption, the NRIs that put together this proposal, they, they, uh, they put together uh, three different questions three different policy questions that are expected to be uh, uh, answered by, by the panelists. And the first question uh, would be, how different communities can develop a people-centered digital economy? Number two is, what are the main challenges inherent to the consolidation of a local, national, uh, and a regional digital economy ecosystem focused on people? And the third question would be, which are the roles and responsibilities envisioned for the stakeholders involved? And how could uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue contribute to the comprehension and consolidation of those digital uh, economy ecosystems? So we, we were expecting in this room uh, the Bangladesh IGF, uh, and apparently they are not present, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the Kenyan IGF, the West Africa IGF, the Tunisian IGF, and the Italian IGF. None of them are actually here with us, but I just had to uh, underscore that they were part of the development of this session and they committed to join us for a broader discussion than the one that we will have today. Uh, at this point, we are going to start the second segment of the session. We are going to uh, listen from the panelists what are the policy a policy perspective that their projects um, uh, have. And after they finish their brief expositions their for from four to five minutes or a bit more, we have time, uh, then uh, we'll, we'll sum up and go to a sort of a more unmoderated debate with all the audience uh, that is interested to engage this dialogue. So, Clisio, would you like to start? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, as has been discussed in diverse panels, the use of digital technology can contribute for social and economic development, increasing efficiency in organization, business, and in the products and services it creates when it's used in a sustainable and inclusive manner. There are gaps in connectivity and e-commerce e readiness which implies that the benefits of digitalization are not equally distributed. Unless adequate steps are taken, the divide will only get wider. This is why a multi-stakeholder multi dialogue is essential. The different communities can participate in the development of the people-centered approach through public-private people partnerships which is crucial to make the digital infrastructure easily and equally accessible to all. This partnership, among others, will enable the decision-making power to deviate from policymakers who are traditionally holding the ultimate decision authority towards the citizens 
through a proactive engagement. In this partnership, each one of them has a role. For example, the government must create an appealing environment that promotes private investment. This could be achieved with the establishment of an adequate policy framework that encourage competition, investment, and promote digital economy, which will avoid concentration and monopolies. This framework should be stable, predictable, technological neutral, dynamic, and flexible with an integrated planning approach. The responsibilities and functions of the diverse government institutions and regulatory agencies that are involved should be clearly established. There are other areas in which the governments should work, such as reducing the high cost of doing business, removing the barriers to digital business, guarantee and preserve a non-discriminatory open internet, guarantee transparency, and also develop digital agendas which promote digital inclusion with an emphasis of the vulnerable social groups, promote the representation of civil society organizations in the digital technology sector, for example, in an expert and advisory groups in which they are currently underrepresented. The private sector should take an active role in enhancing technology, ensuring efficiency and economic sustainability. The private financing is essential to improve infrastructure and for the generation of content and local applications, internet connectivity and for increasing capacity and affordability. A multi-stakeholder dialogue in which policymakers at national and international level, private sector, academia, civil society are involved is essential to address effectively the different policy issues through their experience and expertise. This exchange of technical expertise from different stakeholders can contribute SME the aligning of national strategies the, in the creation of a regulatory and developing ecosystems that enables the private sector to supply solutions in which are, more, are most effective uh, when they are tailored to a particular need and when they are created or formulated with the expertise of the civil society, academia, and the technical community. In this case of these stakeholders specifically, they support the regulators which normally struggle to keep up with the market and technological developments. Working with the relevant stakeholders, the state can play critical roles in ensuring the wide and effective diffusion of digital technologies among lagging sectors and poor communities. This will ensure that the new digital ecosystems generate development for all and leaves no one behind. I hope I address the question in my intervention. Thank you. I think you did, Teresa. Thank you so much for this uh, first input to our discussions. I, I took some notes here. I'll come back uh, to them after the first round of presentations. Uh, Nivaldo, can you provide us some uh, insights from the Brazilian IGF okay. perspective? Okay. The steering committee, or simply CGIBR, is the mood stakeholder entity in charge of issuing general guidelines and developing overarching projects in favor of the development and the use of the internet in the country. As such, CGIBR is also the organizer of the Brazilian IGF. Let me the first place talk a bit about the NRI in my country. The Brazilian IGF is known as the Brazilian Internet Forum or the Brazilian Pre-IGF in 2018. The forum held its eighth edition. As a principle, the forum has been hosted by different cities and regions in Brazil. In an attempt to involve people from different locations who 
in the organization and the substantial sections of the event. In 2018, the forum was held in the center west region of Brazil for the first time in the city of Goiânia. Throughout its eight years, the forum has gathered the Brazilian multi-stakeholder community around the broader internet governational agenda in the country and abroad. Digital economy ha has been one of the permanent topics in our agenda since 2011, when the forum was held for the first time from the rules and the limits of intellectual property, property rights in a digital era to entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and innovation bearing in mean mind challenges, such as uh, internet shutdowns, net neutrality, violations, and the data protection. And the opportunities, for instance, peer-to-peer, -peer, transnational collaboration, and the open technologies. In the eighth edi edition of Brazilian Pre-IGF, this topic permanent our activities. Our 27 workshops had a multi-stakeholders approach, including the local business sector. We had three main sessions, one a specific section addressed to topic digital platform and the data economy. Secondly, let me approach the topic of our panel. An ecosystem is an always involving living entity, a complex system, a community, comprised of different components. A digital economy ecosystem involves not only technical and economic variables, but also social, cultural, and political components. So, from all the discussions surrounding these issues, I would like to list a number of, them, of those two fronts that are essential to be tackled by any policy initiative surrounding the digital economy. From very narrow technical and economic perspectives, I would say that the key words for our discussion, discussions are Internet of Things, of Things, Artificial Intelligence and the Big Data Technologies, coupled with the need for ensuring the security, stability, and the functionali functionali functionality of the Internet. From a broader socio-cultural and political perspective, I believe that data protection is one of the most important issues of our time. In Brazil, for instance, we have recently approved a data protection law but we still do not have a clear perspective on what sort of data protection authority we will have in our country. Hopefully, the government, the government will re recognize our historic successful record with multi-stakeholderism multi in the institu institutional development of the authority. Diversity, diversity, inclusion, and the universal, universality are also principles that should guide the development of digital economy ecosystems. One has to consider the role instead of favoring only bits of the ecosystem. Finally, it's important to highlight that none of those issues can be tackled individually by governments, the private sector, scientific communities, and the civil society. Full multi-stakeholders collaboration is needed locally, regionally, regionally, and globally, as our Brazilian IGF serves as a focal point, a focal point for the Brazilian community. Let me say that we are very glad to see the NRI's community getting, getting together to build this arena for future collaboration. As I, as I am 
running out of time. I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to raise those issues in this session. And I look forward to our discussions, discussions here or elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ivaldo, for that, um, that sort of systemic approach to the, the matter. Uh, I will move forward, by the way, to our friend from the Arab IGF, as we arranged before the session, and then we come to the French IGF, and then we start discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for France, you are our host, too. That's why you stay for the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, will, uh, I, will, I will try to concentrate first on the digital economy challenges we have in the region. Um, and mainly, I will not, to be honest, read all the documents. I will send it to you for full details. You will find it online. I will try to highlight the main issues. Uh, first, although the infrastructure is really good in most of the Arab countries, but um, the affordability of it is still sometimes a little bit expensive. The main reason for that is insufficient competition. The, the other issue is that the employment on the ICT sector is still, I, when I say employment, full-time employment of ICT people it's still below the average range. For example, in Kuwait, we have an example here, 0.5% only, while the average is 3% usually in the developed countries of the, of the total employment, of course. Gender divide, we still have a gender digital divide, we would like to call it, in the, our region. The gap is 20% in the ICT. Most of the Arab countries are still consumer of technologies, as I think you expect this. So we have still a weak level of export in the ICT goods in the Arab countries. Uh, by the way, this is the average I'm talking about because the Arab IGF covers more than one country. Some of the countries, to be honest, we, uh, we are advanced even in software solutions. They export uh, solutions everywhere for the region and Europe and the U.S. too. But um, the numbers I'm mentioning is when you take the full Arab countries that is part of the Arab IGF, 22 countries. Uh, the lack of reliable statistical data. This is a big problem we have in the region. When we want any statistical data, sometimes it, uh, it's not available very easily. Based on the above, the recommendations, again, I will just mention part of it so I don't take a lot of time. Uh, we need more digital strategies, and this is part of, the, uh, of, a, of a study that was made by the UN ASCO in, in our region. Develop digital strategies articulated with long-term development vision supported at the highest political level, which is not available in some countries, sorry to say that. Uh, identify and leverage public-private partnerships which was, uh, which, with sustainability and effective. In Jordan, I'm from Jordan, we have uh, this m more now, public-private partnerships, but in most of the countries still not there. Going to the ICT sector, we need digital strategies and address framework conditions and issue related to employment structures, skills, enabling economy environment and uh, nurturing of, of the innovation to enhance the ICT sector share in the, in the economy. Develop national innovation and digital strategies in close coordination with the, co with the consistent approaches order the remit of high level authority. Um, and I think I will be, I'll be taking the main parts, as I told you. I will move to the other uh, recommendation regarding infrastructure. We need to develop a full uh, unbundling of legacy copper and innovative bundled services. Um, I think this can be even expanded more. Maybe sometimes we can expand broadband using, using maybe frequencies better than copper, uh, in some countries, better than copper or fiber optics because they are more expensive. Uh, develop backbones at the national and regional levels to improve the fluidity of traffic generated by access network. Encourage infrastructure sharing schemes to develop entry for newcomers and equal footing, uh, equal footing with open and fair access to common infrastructure. Uh, the issue about digital divide, the recommendations about it, uh, we need to, to leverage more our fixed telephony infrastructure and improve the internet access experience. Uh, thanks to broadband, this is, uh, this is more enhanced recently. But we need, as we said, to drive more, uh, drive down internet access costs by addressing infrastructure bottlenecks. Um, develop public-private partnership again. To, so you will find that some recommendations in the, uh, covers more than one 
um, problem we have. Uh, <coughs> sorry, regarding the e-commerce or e-business, of course, or e-application, as many like to call it. But my laptop is not behaving correctly with me. Okay, sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Um, national statistical offices to address lack of business to consumer or business to business. Um, I know I'm using sometimes maybe some acronyms that are not used recently a lot, but this, uh, remember when we started the, uh, the uh, let's say the online economy, we used to, uh, to use them a lot. Develop national or cross-border Arab e-commerce platform to allow SMEs and micro enterprises to sell their products online. Uh, develop mobile payment leveraging smartphones, uh, penetration among Arab population. By the way, I didn't mention that uh, we have a problem in the fixed uh, lines, not the, telef the mobile telephony. Mobile telephony in the Arab region all in general, more than 100%. Everybody use mobiles. So the problem now with the fixed lines, less than 7%, which is less than the, uh, the, the world average even. For very simple reasons, seems uh, many didn't have the fixed, but when the mobile was introduced, so everybody is using the mobile now. So this affects, as you can expect, the broadband connectivity. E-health. There was a study about e-health even, how to develop or update a national e-health strategy involving all health system stakeholders by following the suggested three steps approach of the ITU and WHO toolkit consisting of the elaboration of a national e-health vision. Uh, and an action plan need to be developed for that. Develop smart and targeted e-health applications like uh, teleradiology or telediagnosis, considering and front their sustainability and eventual integration within the framework of the national e-health strategy. And finally, about e-applications in general, we need to develop schools, ICT infrastructure, and connectivity to the internet at all stages, in particular for primary and pre-primary levels. We introduce new teaching methods that develop independent and critical thinking leveraging on a smart and efficient use of ICT, primarily targeted to enhance their efficiency. Try to make the main points. I can send you the full document I received from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's going to be a very nice document to share with the NRI's uh, mailing list. Uh, and I took some notes here for eventual discussion afterwards. Uh, so now, at this point, let's see uh, what the French IGF has yes, to thank share you. with us. Uh, thank you. <coughs> so my point is a little bit um, different in nature uh, because I will talk a little bit about the trust in digital economy and from a much more broader point of view, from the point of view of social sciences uh, and sociology in particular. And um, so it's not attached to a particular country context. It's a much broader point. Uh, and I, I, I'm sorry, it will begin a little bit theoretical, but you will see that, I hope you will see that it, that has a very uh, important, I think, uh, policy implications. Okay. So, uh, this, this year, you know, it's, uh, the, the theme is the Internet of Trust, so the trust in digital economy is becoming more and more important, so we are told at least. And um, the question I, I will raise here is, what is this digital trust? What is what we are talking about? So, coming from social sciences, we do not take the concept at face value, let's say. We, 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 we are trying to, to work with um, and to understand what is at stake when policymakers tell us about the trust and the digital trust. So, uh, you know, we are, we, we are told that trust is lacking nowadays, that we have to restore trust, and that kind of discourse is more and more uh, present nowadays. So I, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, actually. So what, what does it mean to restore trust? Trust is not a kind of paradise lost that we can restore, right? right? It's not a, 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 a simple thing that we can measure with appropriate indicators, and then we have just a couple policy measures, and then we have a good level of trust. All this from the social science perspective is quite naive, let's say. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, naive approach. So we, we work in social science a little bit differently, so we work with concepts, and we try to understand what is at stake when, when we talk about trust and digital economy. And uh, here I will follow a prominent uh, sociologist uh, in of 
let's say, second half of uh, 20th century, which is called, which was called Nicholas Luhmann. And uh, his saying is that there are two things to have in mind: that trust, uh, the trust. Um, there are some different kinds of trust, okay, in, including digital economy. Luhmann doesn't talk about digital economy, obviously, but uh, I have. Uh, I develop it in this way. Um, so, uh, what the, there are different kinds of trust, different types of trust. The trust not is not just homogeneous thing that we can develop like that. And then I will explain it. And then once we have distinguished different types of trust, which is very important for policymakers, then we have to say that these different types of trust have an historical evolution. It's not a, a, a um, uh, once for all the time disposition. We have historical historical evolution of trust, of forms or types of trust. So to put it briefly, and I'm sorry for the very, very uh, quick and uh, not uh, very profound uh, introduction, but uh, let's say that there are at least, at least two types of trust, including in, in digital landscape. Uh, the one is what English-speaking scholar call confidence, and the other is what English-speaking scholar scholars call trust, trust per se. So what is the difference? And this is very important, because we, uh, to, 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 to sell you the, uh, the, the, the final point of my speech, uh, the, the point, the final point will be that we have in digital landscape two different kinds of trust and we have to promote one or another. We have to, to find policies to promote an intelligent, an intelligent, uh, uh, how should I put it, an intelligent coexistence of two types of trust which I will be developing. Okay, so the first one is confidence, the second is trust. The confidence is a kind of institutional arrangement. It's kind of social glue. Uh, Lumen talks about habitus, so it's how the institutions support the social cohesion, the, sho the social link between people, okay? And the trust is more of the rational uh, attitude, is, it's kind of risk-taking attitude. For example, if I do some investments in banking industry, I'm in the field of trust. I have a rational, rational science-based, uh, cal cal calculus-based uh, risk-taking attitude. I take some risk and I trust that bank or that digital service, or that uh, partnership, and so on. On the contrary, confidence is about, let's say, social cohesion, okay? So it's, it's a long history of social uh, uh, interactions. And these two are very, very different. That's the point. And today, when we talk about digital trust, I think very often people make a confusion between two very different things, actually. So uh, wh why this arrangement, why this uh, arrangement is important? Because to, to put it briefly, uh, trust per se is not, uh, how should I put it, is not sufficient in itself because you can have trust but uh, lack confidence. What does it mean? So let's, let's take the example of money. What is money? I mean, why do people trust money? in, in, uh, in uh, irrational risk-taking transaction. Obviously, you trust money, but why do you trust money? You trust money because you have the confidence, you have a much more fundamental uh, attitude in institution, okay? In uh, institution, because money is the institution which has a long human history. That, that's the point. So money is example of such uh, difference and complementarity between trust and confidence. So now uh, the, the problem is that this respective weights in society between trust and confidence, and we need both of them, okay? We need risk-taking attitudes in economics, in, but we also need social cohesion, obviously. So these uh, respective weights between trust and confidence are evolving. And the point is, my point is today that according to some scholars, and I think uh, uh, they are right, uh, we witness something like the grow the growth of trust at the expense of confidence. That means we witness something which would be, how should I put it, a prevalence of risk-taking economic attitudes at the expense of social cohesion. 
And that is the point. So when we talk about trust, we have to be very careful. What do we promote in digital environments? Do we promote simply e-commerce, simply risk-taking attitudes, investment, uh, uh, or um, that, that kind of stuff, which, which is obviously very necessary. That's not the point. But it should not be promoted at the expense of much larger, much more profound social processes. So weight is important because we have to understand that actual policies and discourses on digital trust do promote trust at the expense of uh, confidence, of social cohesion. And I will take an example, and uh, I, I hope I will finish in three minutes. I will take an example of this in the field of the policy making. So today, to promote digital trust, what w one of the, uh, let's say, ways which are more and more used today is what I call the policy of trust marks of labels or trust seals. Okay, you know this, it's like I have this digital service which has three stars and another one which has five stars and I have to choose between one which is uh, marked as a more trustworthy and the other one which is maybe cheaper but less trustworthy. So I, as a consumer, I have to make ir irrational choice. So I do not rely on the confidence, I do not rely on social processes or on history of interactions. I rely exclusively on the rational calculus. And this is, uh, for sociology, for, for people um, who have studied sociology, is very, very problematic. So, uh, so one could say trust po this trust policy, trust seal policy, is very good thing because obviously the consumer is much more protected. He, he can now choose from a good service and less, less good service, let's say, well, okay, this is one point of view, but I think that uh, I think there is another one, which is, but also we have to say that in these conditions, in these new conditions of trust, consumer is also deresponsibilized massively because he has only to, be to, to, to conform his behavior to the, let's say, repertoire of chosen behaviors, okay? Now, as a consumer, I have only to choose between what, between, uh, a couple, well, let's say, a handful uh, of services which was chosen for me by the uh, institutions on which I have no possible actions and which I actually, which function I actually do not understand. How do I know what, are, what is going on in uh, institutions which promote that or that trust label? That is the question. So. Uh, actually, I, as, a, as a citizen, if not as a consumer, I am quite, uh, how do you call it, demuni in French, I, I have no means of actions on these uh, so-called third parties, okay? And this is very problematic because this exactly puts me, as a consumer, at, in the attitude of to be limited only in the field of rational one of action of buying something and it uh, completely cuts all the confidence uh, mechanism all the social cohesion mechanism so that that is quite problematic so uh, you would say and i will finish you would say okay but crowdsourced or particip participatory initiatives uh, they do exist well yes and no because i would say that obviously they do exist by the, the tricky situation, the, the trick of this uh, new trust management, let's say, is that even these particip participatory mechanisms are now in the field not of the confidence but of trust. Why? Because precisely because of what I explained earlier, because now the action, the, the one-off action of this participatory crowdsourced uh, uh, trust building, let's say, they are limited to uh, one-off action of consumption, okay? Uh, it, it shows us that uh, not all participatory initiatives are equal because they, they can't be only, let's say, a, 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 um, a, a simulacre of, 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 uh, of real participatory processes. So uh, you see that on one hand we have grassroots me what mechanism of confidence and social cohesion. And on the other half we have, on the other hand, we have this 
trust uh, politics, tr digital trust politics, uh, and which are basically global market regulation mechanisms. Okay, and we have these two extremum, and we have to to be very careful not to be in the situation to 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 promote one at the expense of the other. And obviously, today, what is let's say suffering in this evolution is obviously social cohesion. So th the final question, and I will stop here, is uh, how to design public policies which do not uh, promote trust at the expense of confidence, which do not promote, let's say, simple, rational consumer calculation at the expense of social process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also a social scientist, so you said a lot of good uh, things uh, that seem to make a lot of sense based on what I saw in previous um, in the previous speakers here and I would just try to to put together uh, on a high level what what we've heard from Panama from Brazil from the Arab uh, folks and 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 from France um, so uh, we saw um, Carizia from from Panama talking about tools specific public policy tools and, and she mentioned public policy partnerships as a way of uh, making the policy cycle more prone to civic engagement. And then uh, we saw our uh, fellow friends from, from the Arab IGF talking about specific policy projects, not, not specifically tools, but projects which are needed right in order to advance digital economy in the region from from infrastructure to capacity development uh, the capacity development of the labor force but also to other things related to different sectors in in the digital economy and then we saw the Brazilian IGF talking about a specific two things a specific technological uh, aspects of the digital economy and bringing a sort of a um, systemic approach in terms of uh, cultural, social, uh, and political variables as well, not only economic variables, to those discussions related to instruments and policy projects. And then we saw this great discussion about the detachment of trust, which is a, a, a rational activity and, and, and confidence. Uh, and and one, one of the sentences that called my attention something like uh, we, we uh, under the banner of the digital economy we are focusing on on policy instruments policy projects technological areas which are being advanced and as far as I understood for the sake of uh, of trustworthiness instead of our having a sort of a common uh, social um, social structure in different countries, regions, and even in, in the global level, in the global political economy, that can accommodate the establishment of a, a true digital e economy from an overarching perspective. I think that uh, that might be a, a long curve, just to say that we saw in this panel uh, people talking about instruments of public policy making, priorities for public policy making in different areas, both in terms of uh, public policy but also in technological development. And we ended the panel with a discussion on two sociological variables, societal variables of how we interact with each other within a social context. Uh, I think that that provides a great room for discussion and, and it, it's a pity that we have some survivors in the room at this point. We have 15 minutes uh, left from the session, and I would like to um, open the mic for questions. I see one there, and I would like to say that we can have uh, questions from the audience to the speakers, from the audience to the audience, and from the speakers to the speakers if you guys wish to do so. So uh, I say that we should start with uh, the first question. If you could just state your name, and your institutional setting, if you are allowed to, in order uh, for us to have it to the transcript, I would thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Bredipta and I'm from Indonesian AGF. I'm not, li I'm not actually going to give a question per se, but I would like to comment on the panel that uh, on the digital economy landscape, I would like to introduce what Indonesia has been practicing for uh, quite a few years. When we talk about digital economy landscape in Indonesia, it's very competitive right now. We have e-commerce, we have peer-to-peer -peer lending, we have uh, crowdfunding, we have uh, payment transaction provider, e-money, e-wallet, we have all of this. I mean. It's also sort of like a trend at the eastern part of Asia region because I, I feel that our fellow uh, IGF participants from Japan, from China, they also feel how the econo digital economy really impacting their life currently. We have Alibaba, we have SoftBank, we have all of those big companies are currently playing into this field of digital economy. And in Indonesia itself, the government has been trying to motivate and persuade it's citizen to trust the digital economy provider by, okay, go on, you, you can join the fintech platform, you can have peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending and so on. Government also currently not really heavily regulating the issue. Instead, they only make, uh, for e-commerce, they have uh, e-commerce guideline roadmap, so it requires certain institution to create pol uh, certain policies as its output, and also through its financial service authority, the Indonesian government tries to approach relevant stakeholders such as business entity, such as its government itself, such as public, to hear what kind of digital economy regulation that keen to, keen to be had by the Indonesian public. However, it is very unfortunate that, as you know, where is, there is an, uh, an, uh, some, some uh, advancement, there is also some Im negative impact. Currently in Indonesia, because this issue, digital economy, has not been heavily regulated. Some violation of personal data, personal data, also been happening. I would like to have some concrete example, like uh, for some foreign peer-to-peer -peer lending, because we have some, because you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending is basically a platform operated through internet, and people can easily get a credit, can can get some loan for for their information given and this this information is actually meant to only ask the debtor to pay for the credit that they have however in doing so the provider of lending even use a debt collector that sometimes very very harsh they try to their uh, message them personally every day they even reach to their boss they even ask do something irrational I mean this is the access that I think all of region must also anticipate as well because this has happened and we expect to have uh, you know some some inputs like and, and inform all of you that that this something this is something that we should anticipate I think um, I think at the moment government of Indonesia all and all of the stakeholders including the business entity are trying to solve this this issue however uh, there has not been you know uh, sort of near solution currently instead of maybe blocking the peer-to-peer -peer lending provider or uh, giving or asking or, or asking compensation for for the consumer that has been violated thank you thank you before asking if anyone wants to comment i would say that it's a pity that you are not uh, on the panel with us in order to provide that perspective Especially after um, President Macron yesterday just said that, yeah, we are under the, the hegemony of two models for internet governance and for the development of everything. We have the, what he called the Chinese model and then the Californian model. So I, the, and it's very curious because I know that some of your countries are struggling in between those two models, uh, not in the French way of doing things, uh, but I mean, that's a third way which is also worth of considering and it's pity that you're not here and probably next year if we come back with this discussion you should be here. Uh, I saw that uh, someone else, Jonas I think from Brazil also has a question or a comment to the panel and uh, right after that if you guys want to talk about the Indonesian situation let's just get what Jonas has to say and then we come back to the panel. Good night. I, I know that we don't have much time and it's past six but I think that Something that concerns me is how we're going to introduce in the digital economy discussion the topics around competition and antitrust, because this is a concern that 
OECD is having, G20 is having, and I don't see in the governance, internet governance forums. So we're talking about platforms with 2.6 billion users. So we're talking about on a scale of economical activities that we didn't have before. How can we deal with that? And this, is, this has issues not only for the markets, it has issues to platform responsibilities, to human rights. So I think that it's something that we should address when in the next activities about the digital economy. And a second topic is that I, I really liked Chrysia's uh, content, but something that I think we should think about it because when we talk about release or deploy technologies, we will face because we're not talking about only information and technology services. We're talking about transport. We're talking about health. We're talking about labor. So we're not talking about technology regulation or information regulation. We're talking about labor regulation. So all the debate about uberization, it's a term that's being used in a lot of countries, or all the labor platforms, or in all the debate about blockchain. So we can, if we just look with the, the perception that technologies are inherently good, so we have to deploy them, we can lose the other side, that is that we have to look at economical regulation, we have to look at social benefits or not. Blockchain, for one side, it can be really good. For the other side, we just had a crash coming from uh, an economic bubble. So how can blockchain unleash or allow another bubble. So I think that the digital economy debate, it's complex because we can, it ends connecting all of these spheres from society. I think that we should put all these topics in the next discussions. Thank you, Jonas. I think that your question deals a lot with uh, this notion of pushing forward trust instead of having the social uh, component of confidence. Uh, and uh, I, will, I think that Chrysia was mentioned. Do you want to reply to Jonas' comments? I, I, I actually, Jonas, before uh, give the floor to, to Chrysia, I would just like to say that when uh, our colleague from Indonesia, he said, uh, he, he mentioned something, something came to my mind. It's not directly related to what he said, but I, I was just like, how to trust and, and how to have confidence in the digital economy in a context of monopolistic practices, but also abuse uh, in data collection and uh, use uh, for very different economic purposes. And, and I mean, not only that, but also the way that companies and states cannot secure uh, data is one of the discussions that we actually have to face also when putting this human component approach. So I just wanted to raise that flag because I took that note and I think it dialogues a lot with what you just mentioned, but would you like to go back to his comment? And thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to, I wanted to, to have, I have some comments about the Indonesian uh, experience because that's why I addressed my intervention in the sense of the importance of the government and the importance of the state, different stakeholders because what's happening in Panama is like we are, we have a strong infrastructure in the sense of like submarine cables and connectivity, but we are, having issues in the lack of regulation. And also because we don't have like a, an entity or ministry that is in charge of ICT, we have a lot of multiplicity of entities involved. In, in what is happening now, it's like they are, that's why I said, sorry, that we have to, like, we need a clear separation and distinction of function because what, we're, what is happening is like the same people that are formulating is the same people that are implementing, implementing the, the rules. And then you have this conflict of interest. So that's why we need to have, like, the function separate clearly. And also we have to have this multi-stakeholder um, discussion and dialogue exactly for what Jonas was saying, because this is not only uh, about the technologies as such, it includes health, transport, in the case of Panama logistics. So we need to have everybody on board. 
And we are also, uh, what, what, well, Panama's issue is like we are having lack of, of knowledge and our regulators, they are not, um, they are not really conscious of what is happening, like in terms of innovation. That's why we were saying that we need the civil society and we need the academia involved because we have, I don't wanna say more information than them, but it's clearly that we have a different vision and we, are, we can only, and we, only uh, we can see some other aspects that normally the regulators, they, they, they are not um, used to or exposed to. And, and it's really, I really like your intervention and I take it into account and, and we are going to work on that, that we are also have to, because now we are having this issue with Uber as well, other countries, and, and what is happening now is like our regulators, they don't have the knowledge and they don't know how to take it, to really innovate and like uh, transform the laws that we have to make it more closely to, well, to innovation. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Teresa. Uh, does any one of the panelists want to jump in and to comment on what our friend from Indonesia and uh, what Jonas from Brazil just mentioned. Yes, go ahead. <coughs> after then. Well, Indonesia, great Indonesia experience to its credit. Uh, good to always hear about this. But I wanted to comment about Jonas, to be honest, uh, how to push this. Um, being on the MAG and the Arab MAG now, uh, so we like to hear from our members who are from different countries what things they want us to discuss as the main session. So maybe we can follow the same thing here, uh, maybe to, to reach out to the Global Bank members to tell them what we want maybe in the future, uh, Mag, so we can, uh, in the future IGFs, so they can put it on their agenda when they meet. So I expect maybe we can uh, uh, send them some messages or through the people we know, so because this is something important maybe to be discussed, as you mentioned, in the IGF, not only in the out, uh, in other places. Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> uh, what is the regulation? I mean, uh, it's in relation to what you said and what you said as well. So um, if I go back to this uh, conceptual distinction which was made yesterday between, I don't know, I, I will not mention countries, but let's say ultra-liberal and ultra-state model, okay? Uh, and something in between. Well, okay, but this is not sufficient. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's it's just a declaration, a first step, because when if we have a regulation which is in between, let's say that is possible, but it doesn't solve all the issues you mentioned because uh, this still become the regulation on trust. I mean, this it still can be just a regulation on economic uh, risk-taking uh, investment uh, issues. It doesn't, it, it says nothing about social processes. That's the point, yeah, but, and so all the work has, has still to be done. <laughs> That's my point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are actually at the top of the hour and we have to uh, close the session. Um, there's a lot that has been discussed um, and actually, to be really honest, these NRI sessions, they tend to be a bit uncoordinated and generally they tend, and I'm going to put it for the record, they tend uh, to bring a lot of people uh, that present specific ideas. And luckily, there was something common between those approaches that was glued together by <laughs> the idea of trust and confidence in the end. So we had um, a sort of policy instruments on the one hand, and then we had policy projects and policy and, and technology areas which should be the focus of the digital economy and we had a very good discussion on social trust and confidence. Uh, but I think that as a final word, I, I, I have to say that for next year, we will have to give ourselves the national NRI, national and, and regional IGFs a better thought on how to structure uh, sessions, which are not merely panels in which our different projects, they come here and uh, present their uh, there are different perspectives on, on a specific topic. 
if I'm not mistaken, uh, last year some of us contributed to the mark re mag retreat and, and the taking stock process by saying that regional uh, and national IGF, they should come to these meetings of the IGF not to run panels and roundtables, but to have hand-on hands -on activities in order to build things together. And I think that the way that this session uh, presented itself today is one of the proofs that we will have for furthering discussions on, on how to make these face-to-face uh, -face meetings something a bit more um, uh, more uh, more productive and more uh, more more effective in order for us to advance the collaboration that we have the dialogic collaboration that we have I thank you very much for being here with us I thank you very much for the panelists and uh, I hope that you all if you have an opportunity to provide input and feedback on this session it will help us streamline what actually uh, what actually is intended for the cooperation of national and regional IGFs. Thank you very much.